offer and acceptance and, and those type of things. The offer, okay? Most offers can be oral or written, okay? Some offers must be in writing, but most, most of them can be either verbal or written. An offer must be, be definite in expression of the proposed <coughs> terms and conditions of the proposed contract and how it's to be accepted, okay? An offer must include the identity and nature of the object being offered, the conditions it is being offered, as well as under what terms it's being offered. Okay? And essentially an offer is a promise in exchange for another person's promise to act. Okay, I want to make sure that you guys see this first because we're going to go to some cases now that we're going to apply some of these principles. So we need to make sure that you guys understand these things. Okay? And I get to call on you because you're here. Acceptance. Acceptance of an offer is a manifestation of assent to the terms of the offer, okay? In the manner invited and required in the offer. And we'll get to that in a little bit. It's also compliance by the offeree with the terms and conditions of the offer that also constitutes acceptance. And acceptance can be expressed or implied, okay? For example, I was talking to, as I was showing this uh, slide to some people that work at a pizza joint, and we were talking about the fact that if you order a pizza, right, you call up and say, hey, pizza bar, I want to order a pizza. They say, okay. It's when they bring out that pizza, they've essentially uh, complied with the terms of the contract. So I want pepperoni pizza, they deliver pepperoni pizza, you have a contract there. All right. So we are going to go into some cases, okay? This is an old case. This is a great English case. And the reason that I get, I'm doing this case is because you get to stick things up your nose and blow things in your nose and stuff. So it sounds like fun, right? <laughs> You guys are a tough group. <laughs> it's a carbolic smoke ball company made a device called a smoke ball that claimed to be a cure for the flu. The smoke ball was a rubber ball with attached tube. After filling the smoke ball with carbolic acid, the tube was inserted into the user's nose. Okay? I don't have one to demonstrate, sorry guys. <laughs> the user then squeezed the bottom of the smoke ball to release the vapors into the nose. Alright? And actually Dave said that he would volunteer if I had one. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, the carbolic smoke ball company published an advertisement that said, hey, we will pay 100 pounds to anyone who got sick with the flu after using the company's device in accordance with the instructions set out in the advertisement. Okay, there's the advertisement there. The instructions provided that the person was to use a smoke ball three times a day for two weeks. All right, and the advertisement further stated that 1,000 pounds was deposited at the Alliance Bank to cover any claims. All right, any questions so far on the facts? I think when I read through this, I started thinking about what we do today with nebulizers and those type of things. And I can't imagine what people 100 years are going to think about what we do today, but. Okay, so the question becomes is, was an advertisement an offer? Was there an offer? Can we see the conditions again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they offered to pay $100. So was it an offer? Is an advertisement in this case an offer? Yes. I would say so. It sounds like it to me. Okay, and if it was an offer, why was it an offer? It was an offer. And most advertisements out there aren't necessarily an offer per se. Okay. The offer actually happens when someone comes into your spot and says, I want to buy X, Y, and Z or want to, you know, uh, gauge your services. Because most advertisements out there aren't exactly what you just said, don't contain the requisite conditions and terms. In this case, it did. It said, hey, if you do X, Y, and Z, do it three times a day, okay, for a period of two weeks, and if you get the flu, we'll pay 100 pounds, right? Okay? The court determined that the advertisement was a unilateral offer because it specifically provided how the offer could be accepted. And further, the company's claim that it deposited 1,000 pounds into the bank was further proof that, hey, we had a serious intent to be legally bound, okay? Now, <coughs> Going through with the facts then, this Louisa Elizabeth Carlyle saw the advertisement, purchased a smoke ball, and according to her, used it in accordance with the advertised instructions. Ms. Carlyle got sick with the flu and wrote a letter to Carbolic Smoke Company to claim the 100 pounds. Okay? By the way, her husband was an attorney, so. <laughs> it's gonna be kind of a theme as we go through these cases that there's, yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's a little sad. The company denied her claim, saying that in order to qualify for the 100 pounds payment, that she had to go to the company's office daily to use the smoke ball to make sure that she's using it properly. And it seems fair, right? Because she can't just say she's doing that, right? Well, she refused and brought a lawsuit because her husband's an attorney and they got nothing better to do back in 1892. Okay? All right. 
So, was the offer accepted by Ms. Carlo's actions? Well, they didn't tell her. Okay. Is it in the terms and conditions? What's that? Was it in the terms or conditions? Not the ones that we had carried up there. Was it in a small print that we all can't read? Back then, I think it was all small print, so. They had better eyes back. So you're saying yes. Is that what you guys are saying? Okay. Anybody say no? You say no, Dan? Yeah, say no. Why? Because I don't believe she accepted the offer as it was um, enhanced or changed. Okay. Okay. Well, the court said she accepted the offer. The court determined that satisfying the condition providing the advertisement for using the smoke ball constituted acceptance of the offer. All right? All right. We're going to run to this next one. Any questions on that case? How does she prove it? Did she actually did that? Use the smoke ball? Just based on her testimony. Essentially what happened is that she went to court, sworn testimony, said, yep, I use it three times a day, and probably brought witnesses and say, yeah, we saw it. And today, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't have all those facts, but that's the yeah. witness was the husband. All right, we're going to talk about another wonderful English case. This is Felt House versus Bindley. This case involved the sale of a horse from a nephew to his uncle. Okay, this is one of our phonies that we have at our house. So, um, during negotiations between the parties, a misunderstanding about the price occurred. Okay. Now, has that ever happened between you guys that you have, you're negotiating a contract with somebody, you're in agreement with somebody, and there's a misunderstanding as to what those terms actually are? Two weeks, two weeks ago. Okay, two weeks ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it happens, right? It sure does. Okay, and so when that happens, what do you do? Well, you walk off. I mean, what options do you have? You walk off. <laughs> Start arguing. <laughs> Call your turn. Call your turn. <laughs> <laughs> and what does your turn do for you? Take your phone and go home. Take your phone and go home. <laughs> Well, in this case, as a result of the misunderstanding, the uncle said, hey, I'm gonna write a letter to the nephew that said he would purchase the horse for 30.15 pounds, okay? If the uncle did not receive a response from his nephew, okay? So, hey, look, I'm gonna assume that this is an agreement that we have, okay, for this price, if I don't receive a response from you, and he sent the letter out, right? That seems reasonable, uncle's being really nice, he's putting it up front to the nephew, he's even putting it in writing, right? Sound good? The nephew didn't respond, but the horse was sold at an auction to a third party. Okay? Well, of course, Uncle bought this case, Uncle was, an attorney, was not an attorney, so. Uncle brought suit against nephew for damages based on conversion. Okay? So, was there a contract? No. 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 Why? The nephew never responded. What did he say? No acceptance of the offer. But he said, look, if you don't, I mean, we're in a negotiation and we got a dispute, I mean, we got a misunderstanding here. I'm just trying to clear it up, right? How was the letter sent? How was it accepted? How does he know the nephew got the letter? I was back in 1892. They got the letter. <laughs> By somebody else's horse. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you guys think? So we got yes over here, is that right? No, we had no. Or no's, no's. No. Anybody say yes, there was a contract? Just to be different? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I was wrong last time. Uh, <laughs> I'll go on the other side. <laughs> yeah. No, the court determined that an acceptance of an offer will not give rise to a binding agreement unless it's expressly communicated. And that's what you guys are saying, the honor. Okay? That's important. I see, actually see this sometimes. Um, in my practice, is you need to make sure that you expressly, you know, contact that person and say, all right, what's, what's the deal? You know, back in 1892, we should have picked up the phone, right? Or <laughs> sent the pony with the Pony Express. <laughs> had some sign something. 